Good morning. Hope everyone is well today. I'm going to go over our announcements uh, first. Uh, today we've got some events going on um, that we're feeding the homeless. At, we're going to be here at 2.30. The bulletin says 2, but it's 2.30. But I've kind of got already, um, we're back outside. We did have a place inside, but we're back outside now. And so we're kind of having a limited crew. Um, but if you'd, if you'd signed up or told me you were coming, be here at 2.30 today. And we're going to get everything prepared and then go over there and, uh, and feed some people and love on them. Uh, this evening, we're having all of our connection groups are going to be meeting, and uh, we're also going to have the Bible study that I lead is going to be in here. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 43, and so if you're not part of a connection group and you want to, you can crash my group or we can get you plugged in uh, to another group. Um, this coming Saturday at 6, they're going to have another young adult gathering, and so uh, if you want to be, are you going to be here, Sam? Or? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, be here uh, at 6 o'clock next Saturday, so that's for all the young adults. Um, we in, invite you to take part in that. It's a, that's kind of a group. It's, they're out of youth, but they're not quite feeling over here yet. And so it's a great group uh, just to get together and have a good time and, and have some fellowship. And so we invite you out for that. Um, very importantly, next Sunday at 10 o'clock, we'll be across the street. And um, this Sunday is going to be an all-carrying meal. So if you'd, uh, we need to bring meats and sides, desserts, everything. So... Um, not, not you have to bring everything, but bring um, something because between us all, we have to bring everything. And so we invite you for that. There's a couple of more announcements, but the last one I want to mention is very important. It's a church work day, Saturday, March the 23rd, starting at 8. Um, if you can't be here at 8, just come on. We're going to work probably till after lunch sometime, depending. Um, but, you know, just we're getting ready for uh, just there's some spring cleaning to do and just uh, tidying up around. So we ask you to please um, come out for that if you're able to. Um, we'll have work inside and outside, too, so uh, just come on out for that. I'm going to go over some of the uh, prayer updates and highlight a few. Uh, if uh, Keep Lissy Valentine in your prayers. She's doing better, and she's, she's been doing a lot better, but she's got an ENT appointment uh, coming up, I think, next week. So pray for her that they're able to, to figure out. She went five or six weeks on antibiotics uh, because of strep and everything else, so just pray for her. Um, continue to pray for Gail Meredith, who uh, fell last week as she heals up. Uh, pray for Shelly Huber and uh, Huber and Reagan Cornette. That's Elaine Cornette's uh, daughters. They're traveling overseas, and so uh, just pray for safe travel for those. Uh, pray for Barbara Jones, who's been uh, diagnosed with lymphoma, and uh, and then Betty Hill uh, has got surgery on the 29th of March. So continue to pray for Betty. Um, everything else, there's there's lots of prayer needs and requests in there, and so if you just uh, we always challenge you to keep it handy. Uh, got some time at work, uh, maybe uh, got some time at home to keep it by your recliner or something, and, and just pray for these people because I know they greatly appreciate it. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer now, and if you'll bow with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here this morning, uh, Lord, it's just a, just a beautiful, sunshiny day out there. I, I say this all the time, but what a beautiful area of the world we um, live in. And so, Lord, I, I know I'm thankful for it. And just seeing all the the, the flowers uh, and the trees starting to bloom. I know those with allergies probably don't like it, but it, it is beautiful. Um, but, Lord, uh, we just thank you for uh, where we are. Lord, we thank you for this building where we can come in and, and gather together as the body of believers and worship you and, and encourage one another and, and sing songs of praise to you. And, uh, and Lord, uh, just... Hopefully that uh, we, we learn um, out of reading something out of your word today that, that helps change and transform our lives. Lord, we ask you to be with all those on our prayer list, Lord. I, I mentioned just a few names, but there's many more. Um, Lord, I also know, I, I try to remember this, um, there, there's many that are, are walking around with physical ailments, ailments and illnesses, uh, but Lord, I know there's many um, who are walking around with emotional issues or maybe financial issues or, 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 most importantly, spiritual issues that can really be devastating. Uh, but, Lord, sometimes we just come in and we smile and we, we try to pretend like everything's all right when it's not. And so, Lord, I pray for those people who are struggling uh, in those ways, Lord. And I just ask that um, you provide them peace. But also, Lord, you maybe provide someone that they can share with and someone that can help uh, walk alongside them and, and help them focus on uh, on the truth, and that is you, uh, that you are, uh, that you are what we need um, in this world and, and in the world to come. And so, Lord, um, I just pray that. 
Lord, uh, we love you. We thank you for your many blessings. And, and most of all, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you'll join us in standing again, we're going to...
Good morning. Good morning. Aloha. I grew up in tobacco. Um, that's kind of what our family did for Christmas money, and uh, done it most all the way through high school. And some of my fondest memories are the back patch, because that's when actually my whole family got along pretty good enough to work together to get the job done. Um, some of the hottest days was when we was hauling tobacco in after we cut it, we had load up and take it to the barn. And we go down a roll and load it on the trailer. And I could not wait to get back to the other end so I could get some water. Man, I'm telling you, some of those hottest days are in the back of patches. And I, I'm not a water drinker. I like a Mountain Dew. That's, that's kind of what I live off of. And while I was in that tobacco patch in that hot sun loading the tobacco up, all I could think of is water. I just want a drink of water. You get weak, you get tired, something I throw up. But when I get to that water, it's like, I'm good. You know, I, I, it replenishes me. As I get older, I need water more, I've noticed. Um, I worked at Isaac's Pools for a while, and uh, I trial pool bottoms. So I'm in the bottom of this pool, metal walls, and I'm trailing. And it is a furnace down there. You don't have no wind. The sun's beaming down. The metal walls are reflecting. It just cooks you. And water is your best friend. You don't want nothing but water. You don't want to eat. You, you just want water. As I was thinking about that, I was like, that's how we should be toward communion. During the week, as the, as the work week beating down on you, life's beating down on you, as the sun does, we should be craving this time of communion. The Lord's Supper, yes, but also this unity as one. Because as a body, we're whole. Um, but when we're out in the world doing our thing, we're not whole. We need, we, we need this connection time. So as we prepare to do communion, I want you to be thinking about that, that we should be craving this as we crave water when we're thirsty, uh, you know, to quench our thirst. Um, let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for your son, Lord, how he quenches our lives so we can have eternal life with you, Father. We're, 
I just thank you for the cross, what he had to bear for our sins, so we could have that time with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll be reading out of Matthew 26, 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it, then broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat this, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink it from this. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Good morning again. This morning was interesting. Anybody's power go out? I know I asked you at the beginning, but yeah, a lot of power out. Uh, But we made it, didn't we? We survived. We survived. And our clock went ahead, and we survived. We made it. And so uh, that's good. That's good. We're on on the right road. Uh, This morning, we're finishing up our series that Todd has titled, God's Way is Greater Than Our Way. And throughout this series, we've looked at examples in Scripture that demonstrated how God's way truly is better than our way. Now, our main passage for this whole series has been out of the Gospel of John. John 15, specifically. Here Jesus said, this is what Jesus said. He said, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and He prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And so in this passage, Jesus is basically telling us, in order for us to live fruitful lives, we must remain in Him. We must be receiving our nourishment from him. Now, living for Jesus isn't always easy. But as we've looked at in this series and Todd has talked about, and we know just from all of Scripture, that remaining to connected to Jesus is the best life possible. And it's not just the best life possible because we punch our ticket to heaven and we're going to be going to heaven, because Jesus intended for us to have our best life now. And that's for today and tomorrow and then for eternity. And if you're a Christian, you know that truth. You you know that truth up here. But it's so easy in the busyness of our daily lives that we can rely less and less and less on Christ and we can rely more and more and more on the world. Now, sometimes people sever the line between them and Jesus quickly. Sometimes it's, it's done. But more often than not, Separating ourselves from the vine of Jesus, it occurs slowly over time. Little by little, we loosen our connection to the true vine. In in our lifetime, we have new relationships, new hobbies, uh, new interests, maybe new careers. Maybe our family grows. And, And as Todd talked about last week, all of those are good things. But the problem happens is when we allow these good things to take over for our relationship to the most important thing, to the best thing, and that that is Jesus. And so throughout this this sermon series, um, we've looked at different biblical characters uh, and and scriptures that illustrate the importance of how having a solid connection uh, is, how important it is to our lives. And and this morning, we're going to look at someone who is extremely close to Jesus. 
Um, this person, um, they, 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 they were with Jesus throughout his, pretty much his whole ministry. And so they saw up close and personal who Jesus was. But even so, they often stumbled and strayed along the way. Now, now this biblical figure, he gives me hope. Um, because he had some highs, but he also had lows. But even in the lows, Jesus used this person powerfully in the kingdom. Now many of you may already know, but any guesses on who we're discussing this morning? Peter, I heard it. We're talking about Peter. Peter, the disciple that leaped before he looked, that he spoke before he thought. And, and one thing that's appealing to me, he often stuck his foot in his mouth. And I, and I do that a lot. But despite his shortcomings, beside all of his faults and everything he did, here's what Jesus declared of Peter in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said this to Peter. He said, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And as we know reading through Scripture, if you read through the book of Acts and elsewhere in Scripture, you know that... that Peter was used powerfully um, in the establishment of, of his church. And so we're going to look at Peter today. And we're going to specifically look at three accounts that we have in Scripture of Peter's life. And I, and I want us to see what we can learn that will help us stay more connected to the one true vine. Now the first example I want to look at, th this example occurred after Jesus had fed 5,000. And so he said, fed 5,000 men plus the women and children... And he fed them all with five loaves of bread and two small fish. And, but after this miraculous event, Jesus, he sent his disciples, he sent them across the Sea of Galilee. He said, told them to go on, and he stayed there and he, and he prayed alone. But now when the disciples, when they were crossing the Sea of Galilee, they were crossing the lake, a terrible storm came up. And, and the disciples feared, Scripture tells us they feared for their life. And then as, as they were going out, um, they looked out and they saw something coming across the water. And some thought it was a ghost, but Jesus told them, He said, take courage, I am here. And so here's what I want you to pay attention to. This is Peter's response to that. In Matthew chapter 14, here's what Peter said. Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. And so Peter went over to the side of the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Now I know we often um, see Paul, uh, Peter in a little bit of a negative light here, but, but he did walk on water. He, he stepped out of the boat and he walked. But what happened when he took his eyes off Jesus? What happened? He began to sink. He, he started seeing all the problems. He started seeing the danger. And so he gave up and he began to sink. See, I, I believe Peter here, he, he temporarily connected to the distraction vine. Have, have any of you ever heard of a condition called IFS? I never had either, but I've read a book and it talks about it. Uh, it's called Information Fatigue Syndrome. You may not know what it's called, but I guarantee here in a minute you're going to recognize it. Discussing IFS, Dabrika Savick writes this, Today, information overload and digital overstimulation leads to a digital burnout. A situation where physical and mental exhaustion is caused by spending too much time in front of screens. And so listen to this here, it's very important. Here's the symptoms. Symptoms of this condition are apathy, indifference, or mental exhaustion arising from exposure to too much information. Stress induced by attempts to assimilate excessive amounts of information from the media, particularly social media, the internet at work. This makes us physically ill by interfering with our sleep, sabotaging our concentration, and undermining our immune system. Now don't point at anybody in the room, does it, but does that sound familiar? Can anyone relate to that? 
I can. See, see, see I'm, I'm bad about it too. I can say it. Smartphone in hand. Scroll, scroll. Like, scroll, like. Ooh, I want to share that. I want to share that. And then close that app down and open up another app and scroll and scroll and scroll. We, we have so much information coming. Here, here's a stat that blew my mind. Every two days right now, so every two calendar days, there is as much information that is made, enough things are written, recorded, anything, in two days than were from the beginning of time until 2003. So you think of that. Beginning of time until 2003, every two days we create more information. And then here we are trying to take in information. And we get full of information. If we're not careful... We can let this endless intake of information consume us. And we can allow distractions such as that to slowly disconnect us from the vine. But, but you and I have a choice. As adults, we can choose what we do use. For those of you with children, you can, you can decide, at least while they're in your house, you can decide what they use to, con- to, to get their information. I'm going to show a couple slides. This first one, if you can't see it real well, it's, it's, it's probably set a couple hundred years ago. It's just a fictitious drawing. But, but the, you know, it's a father, and, he, and he's reading out of the Bible, and his wife and his child are there. Now, this is something that was probably done daily. This was pride of, probably pride of their daily life, was taking in God's Word, taking in God's Word. Now, I want you to show another one. That's more what we see now, isn't it? We see that. We see families that are in the same room and they're disconnected and they're all trying to get information from different places. We have more information, and you all know this, we have more information, If I've got my imaginary smartphone in my hand, we have more information in our smartphone than any generation before us has ever had. I mean, we have it all. We have access to it all right here. But what I want to ask you, are the people in this second picture, are, are we any wiser than we were a couple hundred years ago? We have more knowledge, we have more information, but I don't think we're any wiser. In fact, I think we're going the other way. Now back to Peter. So, so Peter, he, 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 he takes his eyes off G, take, he took his eyes off Jesus, and so he was in physical danger. He was sinking, okay? There's an issue today that's far more dangerous than a physical issue like a storm. Because there's a spiritual battle for the hearts, for our hearts and our souls in our minds, and it's not really as much as us, adult, mature Christians, but it's more for the little ones in here and the, and the younger ones because there is an all-out attack from Satan on the hearts and minds and souls of children and, and families in this world. And so as Peter, if we take our eyes off Jesus, we get distracted and we can become confused. We can become fearful And honestly, we can get to a point of despair. But instead of being that way, if we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, even when the storms come, we can endure. We have a a passage of Scripture, and most of you are going to know this one well, but this is practical advice to help us keep our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, we read this. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially that sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And so in a world filled with distractions, keep your eye on Jesus, the the one true vine. Keep your eyes on Him. The second account I want to talk about Peter's life, it's set in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this is after they've had the Passover meal. And, and Jesus, He takes some of His closest disciples and He goes off to the Garden of Gethsemane to, to, to pray. And, 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 he, and He tells us that... Scripture tells us He was extremely upset. And I'm sure for, for, the, for, for the apostles and the disciples, they probably recognize that Jesus was extremely upset. And so He asked Peter and, and James and John, He asked them to keep watch. But what did they do several times? They fell asleep. They, they fell asleep. And we know, if you've, you know the Scripture, and, and eventually, during the evening, Judas, accompanied by Roman soldiers, 
and temple guards, Jewish temple guards, they came to arrest Jesus. And so as they came to arrest Jesus, here's, here's a second thing from Peter. In John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11, it said, Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? And so I want you to think about this. Jesus had at least, we know at least three times in Scripture, Jesus had told His closest disciples about His upcoming arrest and death. He told them. He even told them that week. We have an account in Scripture. The week this happens, but yet Peter still believed it wasn't going to happen. And so when these soldiers came to get Jesus, Peter drew out his sword and he was going to take control. And see, I think that's what Peter went for. He went and he attached to the control line. He tried to take control of the situation. Anybody here like to take control of situations? I know I do. Um, it's an issue I struggle with. Before I fully submitted to Christ, um, I was very controlling. My wife and my family was in here first service, and, and they attested for me that I, I wasn't that way at home. Like I wasn't, the, you know, I wasn't demanding that way and controlling. But I like to fix things. I like things to go right. I like things to be working. And I also like doing things my way, and, and also to a fault. I like to do things my way. But anyways, um, I, like, I like that. That's how I'm wired. Um, but here's the deal. Most of you, most of you know that I, I have another job, and I work full-time in the golf industry. Um, now, in the golf industry, there are issues that are beyond our control. We can't control the weather. We can't control breakdowns. There's a lot of stuff we can't control. But even with that being said, I tried to use the tools I had, the people I had, the equipment, uh, the resources to provide the best golf course possible. And, and I'm pretty good at that. And I'm, I'm not bragging. But I'm, I'm, I, I, I've done it 32 years. And so I've seen a lot and I've done a lot. But, but, but what had started to happen to me is this pursuit of control and success in controlling things at the golf course, it bled over into my personal life. And more importantly, it bled over into my spiritual life. And then one day, I was at the lowest point in my life. And, and I, when I say this, I was done. I was done. I, I, I was done. But then God. What powerful words, but then God. I have my own but then God moment. I can take you to the exact spot I was at. There's a brick walkway going up at Tri-Cities Golf Club. I was walking, walking up the hill to do something, and I literally stopped. And I said, God, I'm done. I am. I, I can't carry this around anymore. I can't take another step without you. See, I gave up control. And I believe God said, okay, good. Now let me lead you for a while. Now from that moment, I've been better, but I can still fall back into the same habits if I'm not careful. I want you to think about our culture today. You ever hear, you ever hear the term influencer? Some of you do. Everybody wants to be an influencer. They, they, want, they want followers. They want likes. They want people to pay attention to them. All of us in here, we, we probably, all of us, like things our way. Um, you know, if we're in sports or school, we want to be the best. We want to be on the winning team. And, you know, that's okay. It's okay to pursue that stuff. But sadly, we're often willing to sacrifice some very important things in order to do that. We can sacrifice our Christian beliefs to get a better grade. Everybody cheats. If I don't cheat, I'm not going to do good enough, and I may not get into this next school or this next program. So it's okay. We can sacrifice our Christian beliefs to get a promotion or a better job. You know, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. i got to look out for myself. Nobody else is going to. i got to look out for myself. We can sacrifice our Christian beliefs to endorse a political party or candidate. I know some people are cringing right now. Don't mention politics. That's what they always say, but I, I can't help it. Our country, even Christians, are so divided on this issue. When I grew up, we used to be able to debate and have discussions on social issues, political issues. You could talk. 
You might be on totally opposite sides, but in the end you could shake hands and be friends and go on with life. But anymore, that's not the case. Anymore, if, 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 if I find out you support this party, then you're not my friend anymore. You're my enemy. You're, you're an idiot. And then you find out who I support, and you're like, you're an idiot. As Christians, as Christians, it shouldn't be that way. As Christians, we're supposed to be different. Now, if any of us, if any of us thinks that a political party is going to save the world, I believe we're mistaken. Because the only way, the only way to fix this world now is the message of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus. And Jesus tells us this. We sang this song earlier, John 14, 6. Jesus proclaims this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And so despite what people in our culture try to say, despite what, what other people, critics have to say, Jesus is it. He's it. Without Jesus, we're nothing. With Jesus, we're everything. But Jesus calls us to something. If you're a Christian, Jesus calls us to something. In Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23, Jesus says this. He said this to His disciples then, and it holds true for you and I today. We're not off the hook. Jesus says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? but you yourself are lost or destroyed. It's a practical advice here for, for any of you here. Instead of trying to manipulate others, manipulate situations, try to control things, instead of that, emulate Christ and your life and your actions. The last account I want to share of our buddy Peter is uh, in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 54. And so this is after Jesus has been arrested. This is after the garden. Jesus has been arrested. And we, we pick up here. So they arrested Him and led Him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it. And Peter joined them there. A servant girl noticed Him in the firelight and began staring at Him. Finally she said, This man was one of Jesus' followers. Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them because he's a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Now, can you put yourself in Peter's shoes just, just for a moment? Can you imagine the shame and the sadness that, that Peter must have felt as this happened? And as the Scripture tells us, there's... You can almost hear the rooster. And then you can see, feel the look of Jesus looking and making eye contact with you. And then remembering the words that Jesus said. See, for three years, Peter was with Jesus. He heard Jesus teach. He saw Jesus perform miracles. And Peter was right there beside him, defending him right there. But even when all that was going, Jesus had told Peter that you're going to deny me. And here was, here, was Jesus, here was Peter's response when Jesus had said early in his ministry, you're going to deny me. Matthew chapter 26, verse 35. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. But you know, this night when Jesus was on trial and Peter, Peter was being accused, you were with him. Things got real. His freedom and His life were now on the line. And see here, I believe, I, Peter, he connected to the self-preservation line. And if we're not careful, we can do the same. You and I here this morning, we're, we're, we're probably one of two camps. We're either a Christian or, or we're at least seeking to be a Christian. We're, most of us here, I believe, we're one of the two. One of the two. 
We come in. We came in this morning. We sang songs of praise. Um, We celebrated the Lord's Supper. We're reading out of His Word right now. Many of you are proudly carrying your Bibles. See, in here, around each other, it's easy to declare our faith. But what about when we walk out of here and we go out into the world? What happens then? I want to ask you, do, do the people in your neighborhood know you're a Christian? The people in your school, do they know you're a Christian? Your people at your job, do they know about your faith? If they don't, they should. They should. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, Jesus makes this clear. He says, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. See, here in in East Tennessee today, um, claiming Jesus, even outside these doors, if you claim to be a Christian at your work or anything, it's relatively easy right now. I mean, you might get mocked. Someone may, you know, to your face or behind your back, they may mock. Um, It it could possibly cost you maybe a job or a promotion, not openly, but somebody could somebody could hold it against you. Or it may cause a friendship. You may have a friend who says, nah, I, I can't be around that. So right now it's pretty easy, but in other parts of the world, and maybe for us one day, it may cost more. But claim Him we must. Because no matter what we lose in this lifetime, friendships, jobs, money, anything we lose in this lifetime pales in comparison to the eternity that we have if we stay firm and we stay connected to Jesus. Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37, we read this. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? You know, we've we've talked about, you've seen the illustrations, you know. um, Our lifetime is like, you know, like my finger. There's my, there's, uh, there's all, I'm 52, I think. So there's all 52 years of my life on that tip of my finger. Eternity, you couldn't fill this whole room with little tips of my finger. And, And so what's it matter what we lose here? to have an eternity with God in heaven. It doesn't, it pales in comparison. So we need to stay plugged into Jesus. Now as most of you know, two weeks ago we read through the entire Bible. Um, We started in Genesis chapter 1-1. Two weeks ago, about an hour from now, two weeks ago, we started reading Genesis chapter 1-1. And we we read continually. We We had 79... 79 different uh, readers. And as young, here's some of the young ones here. As young as eight years old, and they were reading. Um, they were reading scripture out loud. I told first service, you know, my kids were able to work it in in their schedules and then come read. But hearing these eight year olds read God's word, and they're proclaiming God's word. If you read God's word out loud, you are proclaiming God's word. You don't have to be a minister to proclaim God's word, you just read God's word out loud. But to hear these young, Young Christians who were proclaiming God's word over us was just, it was just, oh, it was so amazing. Um, it took us 76 hours. We read 24 hours. It took us 76 hours. Now, one of the many take home points, I had several, several moments where I was just like, oh, that's awesome. Oh, and I mean, I, I had several of those, but the one that I've left with that has left me convicted was. How many times throughout Scripture people were called to make difficult decisions? God told them to do something, and they did it. And they did it. It wasn't easy. As we see in Scripture, it cost them their lives sometimes. It cost them their their health. It cost them their, their wealth. But they were faithful to the call. And as I said earlier, we're not... We're not off the hook for following Jesus daily. We're called to the same thing that they are. But see, here's the thing. We can't do the things, hard things in the Scripture, the examples in Scripture, and we can't do the hard things now. Like forgiving someone who's done something awful to you. We can't, I don't think we can do that on our own, but through God's Spirit, we can. 
And, and so if we're going to live the life that Jesus has called us to live, and, and if you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, if you've accepted Him as your Savior, He's also your Lord. You've got to have both. You can't have one or the other. And so we need to be securely attached to the vine. And that vine is life-altering, life-sustaining, eternal reward-producing. And that vine is Jesus, and we just need to remain in Him. And He'll take care of the rest. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just uh, I, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, as, as, as I look out uh, in, in life today, Lord, I, I see lots of um, families in our community, lots of, lots of kids. Um, I see lots of hurt. I see lots of people that are just searching for something. Lord, we know what that something is. It is a right relationship with Your Son, Jesus Christ. But Lord, in, in order for us to help people and point people that way, we have to stay on mission. And how we stay on mission is we stay firmly attached to You. And, and we spend time in Your Word. We spend time in prayer. Uh, we, 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 we are guarded and, and, and led by Your Spirit. And Lord, You tell us You're faithful if, if we remain in You. You're going to produce that fruit in our lives. And so, Lord, my prayer is for us is that, that we stay firmly connected to You. And Lord, it is my hope that all of us, um, we just don't do that for our own benefit, but we take that mission and we go out into the world and we proclaim Your truth to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Lord, I, I, I shared in, my, in the message here, I... Um, I have issues. I have control issues. I, um, I like comfort. I think our, our society loves comfort. I think we're addicted to comfort. But Lord, You call us to get uncomfortable. You call us to go out and be Your hands and feet. And so Lord, my prayer is for all of us here that we do that, Lord, in our, in our lives. And we, and we seek to bring You glory and honor. And we seek to lead people to You. Uh, because Lord, You are the way and the truth and the life. Lord, we love You and we praise You and we ask for all these things in Your Son's name. Amen. Yes, Ashley's here. It's always, I don't sing. And so it's always, I always like hearing that. And so Miss Ashley's going to lead us in a song of invitation right now. Um, you know, my hope is, is sitting there that, that maybe something out of God's Word, read a lot of Scripture today, Maybe something that was out of God's Word just, just struck, struck with you. And, and maybe you've identified maybe uh, something in your life that maybe is distracting you or, or maybe you need to let go of uh, and you're just holding on to it. So maybe something in your life that you can cut out and, and be more attached to Jesus. That, that, may, that would be an awesome decision. So I, I've hoped some of you have, have made that decision. But as always, we have a time of invitation after any of our services. And, and we offer that. If you've never given your life and fully submitted to Christ, um, the offer is not just for right now. It's, it's any time. Todd and my number is in the phone or in our, our, our bulletin. You can call us. We'll talk to you. Um, because I, I believe He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. And so if you have not made that decision, that's something you can do today. Um, we've also had some families join the church in the last couple weeks. And so if you've decided maybe uh, you want to place your membership and serve with us, uh, you can do that as well. But if you have any decisions you want to make, or if you just want to come up and pray or share something, I'll be up here and, and Miss Ashley will lead us in an invitation song. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing. <laughs>
those, and we're going to sing this last song a cappella. Um, on the screen now. <laughs> First service, three minutes. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. 